welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Hello, everybody. Al Belowski here with another edition of Catholic Mysticism and the supernatural aspects of our beautiful faith. And uh, we, are, we touch on all kinds of topics involving our faith. And certainly with the relevance going on with everything with the pandemic and uh, uh, coming off a Easter Sunday. So this show is in the octave of Easter. As we know, the Catholic Church, Easter, the resurrection, is such a great thing that we celebrated eight straight days because there's so much great, great uh, supernatural graces associated with Easter, and that the resurrection is the cornerstone. It is the whole reason for our Christian faith. Now, we'd be kind of insane to do the things Christians do, to believe in what they believe, to act as they act, to try to live in a certainly countercultural world where we try to come out of the self and give ourselves, as Jesus did, to others. And it's very difficult, very difficult. Even with the grace, we know it is a struggle because of sin and because of our uh, nature to be selfish and want to serve ourselves. But for many of this Easter while there is, it is joy because of the resurrection, because Christ through his resurrection has overcome death and sin. And yet, because of people losing their loved ones in the coronavirus pandemic, and the way right now the world is living, <clears throat> economy falling apart, freedoms being restricted, um, families not even being get together to celebrate Easter, uh, the social distancing has kept us away from hugging, handshaking, and having that necessary contact that human beings must have. And now as we enter more uh, deeply into the uh, impact of this, we are also seeing the psychological aspect of this take place. And people are getting kind of antsy. Uh, they want to start getting back to what we knew before, life as we knew it before, but and we're still under these restrictions. And we just keep praying and, uh, to our Lord that uh, there'll be a quick solution to this and uh, that we will come back to him. Uh, because we talked about this on the previous couple shows, that this is all supernatural. It all has that foundation and base behind it. And that's important for us to realize. And I think, you know, uh, many people are getting the gist of that, that we need to return to God. But as I said, we celebrated the Easter joy of the resurrection and Christ overcoming death. And yet it was tempered because there is sadness. There's a great deal of fear. And they're, you know, right now, it's a trying time. We're being tested, and uh, for people, it's difficult. It's difficult, especially those who've lost loved ones. Um, very difficult situation. And it's tough to, to have the kind of unbridled joy that we would like to um, show and, and have in our lives. Anyway, <clears throat> I thought on this show what we would talk about is the cornerstone of our faith, and that is the resurrection. Because, you know, many, many people, uh, many brilliant people, have assaulted Christianity. Many have said, it's, you know, it's irrational. Irrational to try and uh, step outside oneself and uh, serve others and put others first rather than yourself. It just doesn't make any sense. It's survival of the fittest. And you must do what you need to survive. And whoever is in the way, well, they don't count as much as you do. Looking out for number one. Others claim that it's superstitious. You know, it's just uh, a lot of 
superstitious stuff, going back to pagan things, no different than rolling dice or walking on the ladders, black cats, you know, stepping over a foul line and play baseball and making sure you never hit the chalk. Just one of the many superstitious things that people have done since the beginning of time. And then others just think it's completely absurd to worship and uh, a historical figure that was murdered on a cross is just senseless to them. And they cannot see any rationality to that. And so they claim that the followers are, you know, just trying to get through this life by trying to hold on to something that isn't really true to help them get by with the difficulties in not only their lives, but in the world at large. The example would be this uh, pandemic. And in doing so, one of the keys that they have to do is they have to ignore what happened 2,000 years ago with that empty tomb. So they've got to ignore the resurrection <clears throat> or try to explain the resurrection since Jesus was a historical figure and people will acknowledge that uh, through various theories that, you know, this really didn't happen. But the key for us, <clears throat> and I just want to go on to a subject here because we've talked about science and faith. They shouldn't oppose each other. Um, really, they, they can go hand in hand. But we also must realize that science, as far as proof, with some of the belief in the resurrection or, say, Eucharistic miracles, apparitions, the Shroud of Turin, um, they are limited in that what they deal with is the material world and not the metaphysical. There is stuff beyond matter that science cannot deal with. They are very good with the things that we have here that are material. And when they come up with their hypothesis and they can uh, do wonderful things by uh, throughout history, we've seen this with some of the great um, advancements, especially in medical uh, science, that have been done, that have helped mankind, been a boon to mankind. So you can't look at science as an enemy. Just as if you lean towards science, you shouldn't look at religion as an enemy either. Because while science is very good at dealing with the material world. There are things that they just cannot scientifically prove or disprove. One of them is the existence of God, of course. Um, there are things like beauty, love, um, how we are moved in the spirit and soul that you can't account for in a way that tests matter scientifically or to come up the hypothesis, uh, hypothesis and the theory and then try to prove it. You know, it's the old eye, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And it's hard to define what one person considers beautiful and another may not. But we have these, as human beings, <clears throat> we all have this in us, this uh, way that we can look at things and fall in love. And uh, that's a mystery in itself. And, and what we see in creation and what we look at is beautiful. And these feelings and emotions that just can't it well up inside, this yearning toward God that we can't explain in, in that emptiness that's always there no matter what we obtain um, in a world that has uh, put so much emphasis and importance on material goods and material success. So it's very, very difficult um, for science, of course, it's not impossible to go into a realm outside of the material world. So we have to look at that, and especially with the resurrection, because many people want some kind of scientific evidence, and that's very difficult in the case of the resurrection. Um, it's just difficult with a lot of... of um, our faith beliefs, and with the miracles, as I've mentioned. Um, but science also has confirmed uh, some of these things. Like you can look at Eucharistic miracles like Lanciano and see that science has come up that it's a heart muscle and it's under duress and that um, 
They have the blood types. So very fascinating things have come, and that's why I say uh, together with religion, they can go hand in hand. But the resurrection is one thing that we uh, as Christians want to hold on to, especially in times such as the pandemic or the difficult moments, the losses of loved ones, the health crises, you name it, that explain our faith and give us reason for hope. Because without the resurrection, a Christian or any other human being, at the end of this life, no matter how many years we have, whether it be 20 to 100 or more, we will be annihilated at the end. That's without the resurrection, that we are completely annihilated. We cease to exist. There's nothing left of this, and that's it. And when we take a look at that and view life like that, it can become very purposeless that the only thing that comes uh, to make sense then of a life is to try and please ourselves, whether it's with the basics of, of thirst and food and shelter or whatever it is, to give into our um, so-called animal instincts and just try to please them whenever and whatever ways and means possible. But, of course, the resurrection changes all that because it means that Christ did conquer death and that there is a truth out there that is not subjective but objective and that we need to amend our lives because at the end of our life then we are not elated, uh, not a lot annihilated but we live and we will live somewhere then for an eternity so there are very heavy heavy uh, ramifications with this and whether we choose to believe or not to believe because you know that's the question that jesus asked Peter so long, long ago and his followers, who do you say that I am? It's no different now. It's no different now. That is the most important question, really, in each and every one of our lives. Who do you say that I am? Because we will live our life according to that. Now, getting back to the resurrection, what I'd like to point out and look at is some, just some basic human behavior that we can look, take a look at as evidence for the resurrection, and then the historical evidence, because that can't be discounted. You see, that's not like a scientific hypothesis and proof that we try to um, begin and end with a finding. So the historical evidence is very strong toward the resurrection, as well as the human capacity because one of the problems that I think we as Christians have is many times and I include myself certainly in this is that at times you feel that God is far away and that this all happened so long ago what relevance does it really have now in the modern age in this 21st century that I live in now, and how does this affect my life today? How can it make a difference in my life today, in the world that I live and see at large in? And for us as Christians, remember, is people are people are people. Yes, the technology's changed, but the basics of human living, of human existence, do not. We have struggles to survive, to have shelter, to provide for families, to have love, to have joy, to have happiness. We have sorrow. We have tragedy. And we have art. We have entertainment. These things haven't changed. And neither has the nature of sin in all these years. And neither has that hope in Christ and the resurrection and an eternal home of paradise. So these are basics that people have had for, for thousands and thousands of years, right up to now and right up to the end. And we need to remind ourselves of that, that this event 
that we just celebrated, this passion of Christ, his life, death, his burial, and his resurrection is, is relevant for us today, right now, right at this moment, as it was so, so long ago. Now, one of the things that we have got to uh, look at is that when we look at the historic aspect of Jesus and his resurrection and scripture and tradition of the Catholic Church and the teaching known as the magisterium of the Catholic Church, it's either going to be one of the most heartless hoaxes that ever was put upon human beings or it is the most remarkable fact of our history and our existence as human beings. Now, Jesus was a Jewish prophet claimed to be the Christ that for centuries was prophesied in the Jewish scriptures. Now we know that he existed. We know he was arrested. He was judged as a political criminal because of the threat that people thought he brought against the power of Rome. And therefore, after this trial, crucified like other criminals as the Romans use crucifixion as a way to uh, curtail any uprising against them because it was such a brutal and horrible death. And then, three days after that, after his death, after he was buried in the tomb, there were women. And they went to the tomb. And they found that that tomb was empty. And then in a matter of time, his disciples who had left except for John, said that God had raised Jesus, this Jesus of Nazareth, from the dead, and that he appeared to them in various times before he took his throne and he ascended into heaven. And he gave them a commission to spread the gospel, the good news of the gospel, to all the ends of the earth. And he assured them that he would be with them until the end of an age. And with that base, with that foundation, Christianity took off and spread throughout the Roman Empire. And it still exerts, despite all the problems throughout these centuries, it still has great influence on every human being, even the non-believers, right through the centuries. So let's take a look at some of these things because this is what we want to go for in this historical aspect. Now, we need to look at the witnesses, first of all, because remember what I said, we're going to look at some basic human tendencies here. And one of the things that we need to look at is when we look at the, the witnesses, we see that these accounts of this resurrection were being circulated within the lifetime of the men and women that were alive at the time of the resurrection. Now, what that means is that those people, one way or the other, whether they were, whether they were for against or for Christ or against Christ, they certainly could have confirmed or denied those accounts of the resurrection, whether they're accurate, whether they're true, or whether they're false. So we look at the witnesses of that time. And we look at the four gospel writers. Now we know that is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they were either eyewitnesses themselves or relating accounts of eyewitnesses of these actual events in the life of Jesus. 
And they wanted, they would have opponents. There's no question. So these followers of Christ, these people that were writing about the resurrection, would have wanted to have common knowledge concerning the facts of the resurrection, not only for the believers, but themselves, to increase their own faith, to increase their belief, because they they knew that something marvelous had happened, something that in history that was never talked about, never approached. And they wanted that as much as anyone else, to hang on. And if there was any tendency to depart from facts of this resurrection, then the possible presence of of witnesses that would have refuted the resurrection would have corrected that. And that would have been that. But we don't see that. We don't see that. And you know, we've got to realize that these witnesses then, they saw something. And they knew that something special had happened. And for the naysayers, where were they? And why were they refused? refused? Because more and more people, it seems, were well aware of what had happened after that crucifixion when told of the empty tomb. So we look then, and we look at that New Testament and those writings of the Gospel writers who, again, either had firsthand or, or, or firsthand eyewitnesses themselves or looked for eyewitnesses that could give them an accurate description on what had happened. And we see now with the advances in archaeology that there is really um, no solid basis for dating any book of the New Testament, that good news, after the year 80. And that is a very... Now, that is tough for people to critique against that claim that the New Testament is invalid, that it was written so long after that, you know, they started putting words into Jesus' mouth, inventing this, inventing that. Because when we look at the archaeology and we look at the the New Testament and the discoveries of uh, early documents, they bridge that gap between the time of uh, Christ and the existence existing manuscripts that came from a later date. So these archaeological discoveries, say papyri, uh, documents that are found, they point that the New Testament is authentic evidence. So we can conclude and be quite confident that the Gospels of the New Testament are very valid, and very reliable, and that's the key word, that they are reliable. Now, the witnesses of that time, they were fully aware of the background, of course, of which the resurrection took place, right? Because the body of Jesus, we are told in the New Testament, again, we look at that, and it's a reliable source, Jesus was buried with the Jewish burial customs of the time. And he was wrapped in linen cloth. We know that about 100 pounds of aromatic spices uh, were applied to the wrappings of the cloth about the body. We know then that his body was placed in a solid rock tomb and an extremely large stone was rolled against the entrance of the tomb. Now, some of the uh, stones we know could have been much weighed as much as two tons, and they were normally rolled by a means of levers against two entrances. So we know this. And then we also know that Roman guards 
And we've got to look at this because they were, the Roman soldiers were strictly disciplined fighting people. They were strictly disciplined men. And we know that they were stationed to guard the tomb. And the guard affixed the tomb of the Roman seal. Now that would press their signet ring into wax or some kind of clay and make that the official seal of the Roman Empire, which meant that in the case of a sealed tomb, that if you vandalize or attempted to vandalize that tomb or try to remove the stone from the tomb's entrance, breaking the seal, you would incur the wrath of the Roman law. And what was that? Well, you would be executed by crucifixion upside down. So what a deterrent that is. Because the Roman Empire would send its investigators to find out who did this. And you had better not get caught because it was automatic. Crucifixion upside down. People being what they are, just as today with the deterrence for us to commit severe crimes, they are afraid of doing it. So the people at that time would have been very afraid of breaking that seal. And if the case is made that the apostles had done this because of what Jesus said and wanted to continue some kind of hoax or continue some kind of myth, they would have been very brave to try to pull this off. Now, human nature being what it is, we know, and the Gospels aren't flattering of the followers of Christ. They're rough. They're rough on them. And the disciples even displayed great signs of witness of fear when they hid themselves. Because with the exception of John, once Jesus, they saw what was happening to him, and when he was crucified and died, they were gone. And they were afraid that the same thing as followers of Jesus, they would undergo the same treatment. And they hit the road, and they didn't want to be discovered. And they weren't bold proclaiming anything except to save their skin to uh, not undergo the fate that their master, one, Peter, went out who denied him three times, as a matter of fact, underwent. They didn't want that to happen. And Peter was his closest, and yet Peter denied him three times. And he didn't want what was going to happen to him, what he saw on that Good Friday. So that's human nature. And maybe we would have done the same thing, following a man, expecting one thing, expecting that he was going to overthrow this Roman government, promising us to sit on a throne, to give us the power, we, mere fishermen, normal men, normal women, are going to become powerful when the new king is anointed, and to see that all come crumbling down, and the vicious, brutal murder and torture he underwent. Yeah, human nature says, let's get out of here. Save our skin. And we have to look at that because it's very human. It's so human that you and I, if we were there, might have done the very same thing as Peter and those other followers. And maybe some of us, maybe some of us with the grace of God would have done what John did. But hard to say, hard to say. Now, we look at the empty tomb. Because we look and we see that there were many security precautions that were taken for Jesus' trial, crucifixion, burial, when he was in tomb, the ceiling, as we mentioned just a moment ago, the guard at Christ's tomb. And it's hard, it should be hard for people to, our, to refute that. But they do. So let's look at the empty tomb now. Because what's the obvious thing here? The empty tomb points to the resurrection of Jesus. And when the apostles, who again had hidden or were in hiding, 
when they were told by the women that the tomb was empty, they went to see themselves. And once they did, they began to put two and two together. They didn't go off to Athens and Greece, and they didn't go to Rome to say that this Christ that they followed had been raised as he had foretold. They went back to where? Jerusalem, where all this happened. And it's what they saw in that empty tomb and what they realized that if they went back to Jerusalem and came to teach this and that teaching was false, it would have been so evident so fast that would have ended. But the thing with the empty tomb is that it was too unbelievable, too remarkable, that it could be denied. Because if this was a hoax, if this was a lie by Jesus' followers, again, they didn't go to the far ends of the earth here to preach Christ raised from the dead, they went to Jerusalem right where these events had just happened. And that hoax could not have been maintained, not in Jerusalem, not for a single day or a single hour, if that empty tomb had not been established as a fact for all those concerned. And we've got to realize that. Because when we look, again, with this historical impact that both Jewish and Roman sources and traditions admit there's an empty tomb. Now, they arrange these sources from Josephus to 5th century Jewish writings. And, excuse me, even from hostile sources, this is still strong historical evidence. And because when you look at this, it means that if a source admits a fact is not in its favor, then that fact is genuine. And there were people certainly at the time that were writing that it wasn't favorable, to, favorable for them to write that Jesus Christ of Nazareth had risen from the dead. But they did write there was an empty tomb. So a strong historical fact. Now, Gamaliel, and we remember him from Scripture, he was a member of the Jewish high course, the Sanhedrin. He himself put forth that the rise of this Christian movement was God's doing. And it could not have been done if that tomb were still occupied by Jesus. Or if the Sanhedrin knew whereabouts of Christ's body. They would have exposed it and ended the movement. So when we look at this historical research and we look at the sepulchre, sepulchre where Jesus was buried, that, that belonged to Joseph of Arimathea, that it was empty on that first Easter. And there's not a shred of evidence, not one, to be discovered in any literary source, any writings, or any archaeology that can disprove this statement. Now, we saw on Easter morning that if we put ourselves in place of the women, that the first thing they would have noticed as they approached the tomb was that a one and a half to two ton stone that had been in front of the door of the tomb was moved aside. And it wasn't just rolled away from the entrance a little way of the tomb, but from the entire massive sepulchre. 
and it looked as if it had just been picked up and tossed away. Now, let's look at that. It's massive stone, because one of the objections is that, again, it's the hoax perpetrated by the apostles was that they would have had to come to the tomb, been very, very stealthy, and very quiet, get around the sleeping the heart. And then without waking them, they would have had to take those levers and roll that stone, move it way out of the way, steal Jesus' body, and then make off with it very quickly without any of the guards awakening or being aware. And again, these were disciplined military men. Okay, so again, we look at his history here, and we look at some basic facts of human nature and human life. Now, we know that one of the things that people uh, say happen is, well, maybe the guards took off. They got bored. They didn't want this duty. So they hit the road. They left their place of responsibility. Now, let's look at that. We again, repeat it again, that Roman military discipline was exceptional. And one of the reasons is that offenses that were committed by the Roman guard, well, that required a death penalty when you broke them. And they had a fear of their superior's wrath and the possibility of death that, believe me, would cause them to pay attention to the minutest details of any of their assignments. Uh, and one way a guard could be put to death, because again, these were deterrents. The Romans were really good at deterring people by using the means of fear. That the guard, let's say one left an assignment, let's say one guard uh, fled the tomb and he was caught. Well, one of the ways he could have been put to death was to be stripped of his clothes and then burned alive in a fire, started with those garments they took off. And one of the things the Romans did, if it wasn't apparent that they could get an individual soldier that had failed his duty, then they would just draw lots to see which one would be punished with death for the guard's unit's failure. So one was responsible for all, and all responsible for the one. So we're asked to believe in this particular theory to dispute a resurrection that the entire unit would have fallen asleep or left with that kind of threat over their heads. Again, human nature, this isn't going to happen because that Roman military discipline would have produced a flawless attention to duty. Even in, oh, again, those uh, minutest details and especially with something so important as this when they had just tried and executed a criminal for insurrection. Now, when we speak of the empty tomb, and we're going to uh, look at this, because it wasn't completely empty, was it? No. Because what do we have? We find something that's pretty phenomenal. We're told in Scripture, this New Testament, reliable, we've already established it's a reliable source through the witnesses. And John looked into the place where Jesus had lain. And what was there? Not Jesus, but the grave clothes in the form of a body. And they were empty like an empty cocoon of a caterpillar. 
And if we looked at that, wow. We would have seen those empty clothes and what would we have thought? What would we have thought? We need now, if we had been there and saw that, we would have believed instantly. And then we have, when we look at the history, that Jesus appeared to various people. And when we look at history, and we see that many eyewitnesses, that we have a great large group of people that have sanctioned, then we can say with confidence that whatever that historical event was, we can be fairly, it, it would be regarded as well established. And if we witness the crime, and we did our due diligence. And then when we looked at a police record, a report of it, and we saw that that was fabricated, we as an eyewitness to the actual crime could refute it. And that's, when we look at the resurrection, that is important for us to remember because we know that there were over 500 witnesses and that was a large, and this was after the resurrection morning. This is, this is huge. So we've got a large number of witnesses that Christ resurrected that Easter morning. And St. Paul in Scripture talks about that Christ had been seen, as again, I mentioned the 500 people at one time. And the majority of those people were still alive and could be questioned at that time. And this gives authority as historical evidence evidence, because those 500 people that had witnessed this resurrection were alive. So in essence, St. Paul was saying, you don't have to believe me. Ask one of the many people or several of them that saw him if you don't want to believe me. And that, we know, St. Paul, this is a genuine letter of his, within 30 years of that resurrection event. And that's pretty strong evidence. Now, that is a very, very strong key and point to Jesus' resurrection was his appearance to those that had witnessed to him. Now, when we look again at witnesses, let's look at those, to be fair, to those who didn't believe or were actually hostile or unconvinced. And we look and see that, well, you know, maybe Jesus just appeared. It's kind of funny. Don't you think it's a coincidence that he appeared to just his friends and followers? And that's used, of course, why? Because then it waters down the amount of witnesses, the amount of people that saw him. And that's an argument that people make. But, you know, that doesn't hold any water. It really doesn't. Because if you're fair, let's take a look at Saul of Taurus. Now, most of us know that Saul of Taurus was not a follower of Christ. Saul of Taurus was actually what? Persecuting and killing Christ's followers up until what? 
up until this saw of Taurus had a life-shattering experience when Jesus, who was crucified, appeared to him. And he wasn't a disciple, and that's an understatement. Again, this Saul was murdering followers of Jesus. And we know that Saul, after this experience, this life-shattering experience of Christ, became the apostle Paul. So that right there, that one case right there refutes that Jesus only appeared after his death and burial to his friends and followers who would so-called back him up. And that is very important for us to remember because Jesus appearing to just a little bit of people or his followers or his and, and they were little people or his friends or followers, excuse me, doesn't hold water. And that, we can throw out the door for that um, critique. Now, let's look at another um, argument against the resurrection that went to the wrong tomb that the women who reported the body missing had gone to the wrong tomb. That means, too, when the women told the disciples that they found an empty tomb, they also went to the wrong tomb. Now, let's look at this. Jewish authorities at that time asked for a Roman guard to be stationed at the tomb to prevent Jesus' body from being stolen. They wouldn't have been mistaken about the location, nor would the Roman guard. Why? Because they were there. And the key here is that if the resurrection claim was because his followers went to the wrong tomb, you and I both know that those Jewish authorities would have lost no time in producing the body from the proper tomb where they knew it was, and then ending once and for all any talk and rumor of this Jesus' resurrection. And one of the, um, one I've, I've heard uh, myself is that they all had this mass uh, type of hallucination. And again, that, that's really, really a, a stretch because first of all, it doesn't, it doesn't jibe with the historical facts that we've talked about. And if they actually had the body of Jesus, then the question begs itself, why didn't they produce it if it was a hallucination? And then a recent one, a newer one, I should say, not that recent, but newer, was that Jesus is what they it's called the swoon theory. I don't know if you've heard of it, that Jesus didn't die. But because he was tortured, exhausted, he lost a lot of blood, we know that, he fainted. And everybody thought he was dead. And therefore they buried him. But later, he resuscitated. And the disciples, of course, thought, oh, wow, he rose from the dead. And again, we're asked to leave from people, again, human nature. Let's just take a look at this. You're asking us to believe if that happened, if Jesus swooned, that those followers, those ones that had ran, those ones that were hiding, Jesus would have needed what? First of all, he'd be half dead. He'd be probably sick, very weak. He would need some type of medical treatment. He would require bandaging from his wounds. He would need care. He would have to take time to be cared for to gain his strength back. And he would have had to give in 
and yielded to all those sufferings. And then we're asked to believe that these disciples who would have done this would have seen Jesus in this condition if he swooned, in this weakened state, in this state of need. That would have given them the impression that he was the one that overcame death in the grave, defeated Satan and sin, and now we're going to go proclaim Jesus resurrected after what we saw as our ministry? No. No. Human nature, they may have been glad if that happened that Jesus was still alive, but he would have had a weakened impression by his followers. And it wasn't an impression that made them make up their mind to give their lives up. And it wouldn't have changed their sorrow into a great enthusiasm and joy and then elevated the respect and reverence they had for Jesus, but they wouldn't have worshipped him, not seeing him like that, because they would have known, hey, he didn't conquer death. Look at it. He needs our help. He's human. He's like us. Maybe a leader, but not one that defeated the devil and death itself. And if we look at one more, and that's that, again, back to the body, because that was a popular one, being stolen while these Roman guards were sleeping. And, again, you know, it, it takes, that's a big stretch. That's a big stretch. And the theory that the Jewish or Roman authorities moved Jesus' body is, no more reasonable as an explanation than the theft by the disciples. Because again, if they knew where it was and they wanted to end this, they could have just said, you know, we moved the body and we'll show it to you. So he didn't rise from the grave. And again, human nature. Those disciples who had saw what happened to Jesus ran, denied, hiding. And now all of a sudden, they're supposed to be so brave, so daring to face a detachment of soldiers wrecking that tomb, breaking the seal, and risking what in just a few hours they weren't re- ready to risk, and all of a sudden, such a short span of time, they are. That's a stretch. That's a stretch. So when we look at all these, these historical facts, and we look at this, We can look and say that, yes, 2,000 years ago, this Jesus was tortured, murdered, buried, and rose. And, again, it has an impact on every human life. And when we want to look, again, at what this means, and, and... best evidence, like the police show say, if you, if you want to go that way. When we look at the disciples' lives, and those are the early questions, we need to ask ourselves this question. It's people are people. This age, the ones before us, the ones that will come after us. What caused those disciples, those early Christians, to go everywhere? Spreading the message of the risen Christ. There was no visible benefits that were they that they would have gained from their efforts. There wasn't prestige, certainly not, certainly not wealth. They didn't get an increased social status or any material benefits at all that would might move a person to do something like that. Because they did it because they saw something. They saw something that did change into joy, into worship, into enthusiasm, into being willing to die for this total and heartfelt and all-in allegiance to the risen Christ who they saw rise from the dead. And what did they receive for this? 
They were beaten, stoned to death, thrown to lions, tortured, and crucified. And every method available by the powers that be were used to try to stop them from talking about this. And you see, the ultimate proof is that they laid their lives down with complete confidence in the truth of their message based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's the question we need to ask ourselves. When confronted with this overwhelming evidence for Christ's resurrection, the question it does matter for you and me is what difference in my life does it make? What difference in my life whether I believe or don't believe that Jesus died for my sin, rose again so that I could share eternal life with him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. We know, brothers and sisters, that Christ is alive as he was during that time. And he is living with us today. Right through this pandemic, right through the suffering and the sorrows and the tragedy of those who have lost our loved ones, those who are sick, those looking for a cure, the leaders that have to make very difficult decisions, He's there in our fear, in our panic, in our unknown. He's walking with us now, alive, and telling us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection, and I am the life. My people, that is what you celebrated this Easter. Have no fear, but trust in me. For yes, as I told my followers, in this world you will have trouble. But have confidence, for I have overcome the world. And I have prepared a place for you. If I had not, I would have not told you so. So be of start heart and stout mind, brothers and sisters. For Jesus is alive and he has risen. Alleluia. 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 He has risen. He is our Lord. And it means that at the end of our lives, we will not be annihilated. We will not cease to exist as if we never existed at all. No, no, brothers and sisters. But that resurrection means life, life in abundance, life in joy, in peace, in love, and happiness, and it is eternal and will never, ever, ever be taken away. And that's what the resurrection means to you, And for me, that that life that we treasure and love, even if it's a difficult one, with Christ in our lives, will be better. And that at the end of our lives, which we all one day will face, whether it's in this pandemic or whether it will be years from now, that one day, He will wrap his loving arms around us and say, well done, my servant. Well done. Now come and enter into the joy in the place that I have prepared for you. Good night and God bless. 
Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.